section six of the rover volume one number one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number one edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section six the duel some years ago while travelling in the north of england i took occasion to visit one of its old gothic churches and while there my attention was attracted by the sound of a voice chanting a sublime and beautiful hymn after listening for several moments the voice ceased and i walked gently forward and saw a man of middle life leaning against the rails which enclosed a very noble monument and looking up to it steadily with eyes full of tears i expressed a fear that i was intruding he turned and looked upon me with a thoughtful glance as if he would read my heart whether it was my manner or my countenance that reassured him i know not but he replied courteously and did not as i feared he might have done move away the paleness of his face and the dew upon his forehead alarmed me with the fear that he was about to faint i caught him by the arm as he sunk down upon his knees and lifting up his face with closed eyes upon the lashes of which tears quivered he asked me if i did not know him and if i could bear to look upon and speak to him the earth does not contain said i a single being upon whom i dare disdain to look or to whom i could not desire to speak with charity but to one whom i found engaged as you were when i entered and from whose lips i heard the hymn you have just ended i would speak at once as to a brother in the best of bonds alas replied the stranger but i am not a christian i am without that hope yet it is a mournful pastime to me to repeat that lovely song i do it often constantly it operates like a lullaby to my tossed mind as a mere opiate and while i listen to my own mournful voice i am tranquillized and pleased and forget that i am a murderer i certainly started i was for a short moment struck mute till as i looked upon his sad penitent form he had fallen upon his knees i entreated him to rise and come into the open air that he might recover himself i helped to raise him up saying you cannot be a mere murderer whatever you have done i look upon you more in pity than in anger confession of your offence is a duty it is the only reparation which you can make to the broken laws of man to the violated law of a higher power you can make none but there is yet room for repentance no said he i am no common murderer for it was mine own familiar friend that i slew and though the law of heaven was broken those laws called the laws of honour were not and i am free and have been these twenty years i understand you i replied it was in a duel that you killed your friend even so he answered you shall hear my story if you are a sorrowful man i shall make your sorrow light by comparison if you are happy it will acquaint you with grave sad thoughts which it may not harm you to entertain arthur hill and myself were schoolfellows friends we lived in the same county within a few miles of each other and our intimacy sprang up from our travelling to and fro to school in the same chaise moreover we were of like age like taste and read in the same class we were both younger sons and though receiving a general education were both designed for the army hill in compliance with his own choice and i because my mother was promised a commission for me and desired it at sixteen we both received our appointments and i shall not forget till i die the glad and affectionate expression of hill's countenance when he brought me the gazette and i found that our commissions were dated on the same day and were in the same regiment the corps to which we were attached was stationed at sandown fort in the isle of wight and we joined together in the early spring of eighteen blank 
the friendship we had formed at school strengthened every hour and those officers who were our seniors in rank and life never wanted some pleasant or kind word for us it was upon a hot sultry evening in the month of august that a small group of the junior officers were idling upon the sands near the fort and hill and myself were of the party hill had got on a new foraging cap which was very becoming to him and i was quizzing him upon his vanity from which of a truth never was a youth more free as i well knew i was in exuberant spirits and only joking but others being present perhaps made the joke unpleasant to him he coloured and looked grave and i thought that he was a little out of humour and deserved to be shamed into a better temper reckoning on my frequent experience at school i made sure that i should soon bring back his handsome smile accordingly i went bantering on i was in a foolish mind uttered many absurdities and laughed all the while convulsively woe to light hearts they soon forerun our fall at last finding my words had not produced the effect i intended i caught him playfully about the waist and lifting my hand to the back of his head tipped off his cap which fell upon the sand he released himself from my grasp petulantly and stooping for his cap bade me not do it again in a manner rough and as i thought rude i had never seen him in such a touchy mood before a circumstance which if i had had one moment's reflection would have made me stop my folly for i well knew his fine disposition his real generous and loving nature but i was beside myself i laughed louder than ever stole again behind him and again pushed off his cap whether it was the heat caused by stooping that wound up his anger or some more mysterious impulse i know not but as he raised himself his face was red and his eyes shot fire and observing that he did not like practical jokes he dared me to do the like again the menace did not open my eyes though it was plain i was going too far but it was not pleasant to me to be checked by a threat before so many of the officers and not dreaming of anything beyond a trip-up or a wrestle and a fall such as we had often given each other at school i went up to him once more and jerked off his cap again he did not stoop but aiming a straight and violent blow at my breast for which i was wholly unprepared he knocked me down i was instantly picked up by a tall vulgar young man who had lately joined the regiment by exchange in consequence of some affair of honour in which he had been engaged with his captain and who was a ready agent of mischief this business said he can only be settled in one way and the sooner the better i cast my eyes round to look for hill he had caught up his cap and was walking away bareheaded and two brother ensigns following him one of whom i knew had a pair of duelling pistols a little fellow who had only joined a few days and was not more than fifteen and to whom we had both been kind came to me o oh, vernon said he run after him make all up it was all foolishness why it was only play till he got vexed and that was your fault i'm sure he was sorry let us all agree to say nothing about it at mess and to keep it from the colonel such was the thought of the artless boy oh that he had had man's wisdom i mean not that of such men as were with us then for my tall friend called him a young blockhead and bade him hold his nonsense and remember that officers were not schoolboys to think that of the seven persons present there was but one peacemaker and he a child had he but gone to the colonel or any of the senior officers there would not have been wanting some worth and wisdom to stand between the boys and their calamity as it was we were both in the hands of wicked and unreasonable men both the dull and passive slaves of a cruel custom my tall friend went home with me to my barrack room and wrote a challenge which i copied scarce knowing what i did he carried it himself and was long away how busy were my hopes during that interval he will make an apology methought he will do anything rather than meet me the mischief-maker at last returned he brought no note a verbal consent to meet me i never saw such a fellow said the wretch who had volunteered to be my second knock a man down and then offer him an apology why you would be both turned out of the service he for offering and you for accepting it i would give my life i replied to avoid this meeting if it were possible well said my second it is not possible however it is a pleasant and safe duel for you for after receiving your shot he'll of course fire in the air and make an apology but go to the ground he must 
and you need not be uneasy perhaps you may miss him perhaps i may miss him said i why i would not fire at him or hurt a hair of his head for the universe as to that replied my mentor aim at him you must you are the challenger you must not call out a man and make a fool of him and a mockery of a duel and expect a couple of gentlemen to stand looking on as seconds at such a piece of chicken-hearted child's play no no that will never do i feel for you my dear fellow but your honour is at stake it is a sad annoyance but it can't be helped i am engaged out to supper and i shall not go to bed to-night so i shall be with you in time five is the hour you need not worry about anything i have got pistols the heartless wretch left me alone troubled bewildered almost out of my senses i walked about my room i sat down i lay down on my bed i was in a sad confusion of thought my brain was wearied with its working i fell asleep i woke at four o'clock and got a light washed and dressed myself my servant whom i had roused stared at me and asked if i was unwell i said a little so might he fetch the doctor then no the only comfort i could find or make was in the resolution to fire wide of the mark the only prayer my heart could breathe was the fervent wish that i might manage it well all's well that ends well said i to myself we shall be friends again at breakfast as if nothing had happened arthur loves me and i him better than all others it wanted some minutes to five when my odious second arrived with his pistols wrapped in a silk handkerchief we exchanged but a very few words but as we walked to the ground he said unfeelingly this will not be a pistols for two coffee for one kind of a duel but a very harmless one i'll answer for it my yonker so you need not look so pale my very blood ran chill as he spoke and i felt terrified we proceeded in silence to the sands hill and his second were already there i hoped the duel might yet be averted i longed to run over to hill and to press him to my heart the ground was measured as i found myself opposite the youth whom i best loved with a pistol in my hand my eyes swam and i felt sick and giddy all the presence of mind i had was intent upon making sure to miss him i heard the words ready present i raised my pistol with a careful slowness and according to the rules when i had gotten the aim i designed i fired in that moment guilt remorse age and despair fell as it were upon me and they have dwelt with me ever since for twenty long years they have held me in their cruel hands my hope shuddered as my finger pulled the fatal trigger i dared not follow the shot with my eyes but i heard the fall and fainted upon the earth when i recovered my senses i was laid by the side of arthur hill upon the sand and he had got my hands in his and he was looking at me kinder and sadder than i ever saw any body upon earth look and in a few minutes with a heavy sigh he died poor arthur i killed him and i have never been quite well since not to say quite right that hymn you heard me sing was found in arthur's desk copied out in his own hand and his friends sent it to me two years ago to comfort me and it does for the time but i'm very miserable good sir very i saw plainly that his reason had never been perfectly restored but i strove to console him with the only consolation that there is for such a sorrow or for any other and i prayed for him and walked with him about half a mile to a house where he lived with his uncle a country gentleman of small property who told me that his nephew ranged about the park of boughton and its neighbouring villages quite unmolested and harmless that he seldom spoke to any one and that he was much surprised at his having related to me the story of his melancholy but that it was quite true he had left the army instantly and had never been able to settle his mind to anything since but was very devout and very humble and lowly and nothing ever gave him so much comfort as to meet and talk with christians when he felt well enough but he had views as concerning himself that were very gloomy and which no one have been able to dissipate end of section six